the basic reading of the polls right now would indicate that in a Trump-Biden rematch, Trump is a slight favorite. But that doesn't account for you know, what if there's a conviction? And there are also significant risks on the Biden side. Joe Biden needs to win the popular vote by at least a couple points to actually be considered the favorite in the Electoral College. This is Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. I'm Jesse Arm, Director of External Affairs at the Manhattan Institute, and I'll be your host for today's episode. My job at the Manhattan Institute essentially boils down to taking the often complex public policy ideas developed by our brilliant scholars and thinking about how to promote them in clear terms to lawmakers and other key stakeholders, like voters. As we are now less than one year away from Election Day 2024, I thought it would make sense to host an episode with someone who is an expert on using data science and survey research to analyze how Americans think about policy proposals and selecting their political leadership. Patrick Ruffini is the co-founder of Echelon Insights, a next-generation polling, analytics, and intelligence firm. He began his career as one of the country's first political digital practitioners. He managed grassroots technology and outreach for President George W. Bush's 2004 re-election campaign and previously ran digital strategy for the Republican National Committee. He is the author of a new book entitled Party of the People, Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. Today, we'll speak with Patrick about ideas from his book, the state of the Republican Party, the 2024 election, and how to assess what voters actually want from government. Patrick, welcome to Manhattan Insights. Thank you, Jesse. It's great to be here. For the folks at home who may not have read your book yet, can you spell out the main thesis for us? In the book, I argue that there is a realignment happening in American politics. Of course, we saw it in 2016 with uh, the surge of white working class voters to Donald Trump in Midwestern states. And you also saw a surge of college educated voters uh, towards the Democrats away from Trump with Trump as the figurehead of the Republican Party. Um, they reacted pretty strongly against him. Now, this was a positive sum trade in 2016 because the working class voters were located in key Midwestern battleground states, the states like Pennsylvania, states like Michigan, that Republicans uh, were always kind of like Lucy in the football uh, with those states. Uh, they always contested those states. They always tried to break through in those states and could never do it until, uh, you know, until a very different kind of Republican candidate presented themselves. Uh, on the opposite side, you had the college educated voters who moved away from Donald Trump, right, were located mostly in safely blue states, uh, in coastal states, uh, because of the geographic sorting, uh, you know, we've had in this country throughout the last 40 years, it used to be college graduates were distributed evenly throughout the country. And now they're kind of located more and more in these superstar metros that and it led to an extremely inefficient democratic coalition, which only got worse in 2020. So the second part of the story is 2020 and this working class uh, education realignment extends, be, starts to extend to more communities, um, uh, Hispanics, Asians, and even uh, more uh, steady growth uh, in the Trump vote share among African-American voters. So, so let's pick up on the educational you know, realignment, uh, the new kind of coalition that you talk about. I'm curious about its durability. It's undisputable, obviously, that the GOP became more multiracial, more working class, and more populous with Donald Trump as its standard bearer. But do you believe that realignment is necessarily a permanent fixture in our politics? Or is it something that may fade once Donald Trump's time in public life comes to an end? In other words, is it, is it something real and sticky, or is it just sort of you know, good branding associated with Donald Trump? I think that's a good question. Um, I, the bet that I'm making that it is more durable I mean, I think there are really a few factors that go into it, and these are structural forces rather than forces that are specific to Donald Trump. Um, so I think one, number one, I think you've had a, the trend going basically in one direction for the last 50 years. Um, you've had a, a, in the sense of more educated voters voting more for parties of the left and more non-college educated voting working class voters tending to uh, progress more into parties of the right. You've had this kind of class role reversal where the Democrats used to be this party of the blue collar worker and Republicans used to be the party of the country club. And now that's flipped. 
Um, so you go back to 1964, 1968, 1972, all saw this sort of realignment. Then it paused for a number of years. And then in 2000, uh, you saw it progress even further with um, with George W. Bush and the red-blue divide, right? The, the rural states like West Virginia flipping to, going to Republicans, and then uh, they don't go back. And then in 2016, it, before 2016, it pauses for a while, and then you have Donald Trump. The second thing is I just think we are becoming uh, a more, uh, you know, a, a, as it relates to the non-white vote, um, we are becoming, this is not the same uh, kind of uh, vote, voting, uh, racial block voting that I think we had in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, that we're seeing more and more African Americans, Hispanic, Asians moving to suburbs, to more integrated communities. This is especially, uh, you know, impactful, I think, for Hispanics and black voters. Um, and, you know, the social science is pretty clear that uh, when you do, uh, when that happens, um, people, their voting patterns tend to change. Um, you have the rise of intermarriage. People not necessarily, people who are classified as non-white, uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, back in the 80s, for example, the vast majority of people who were non-white in America were African-American who supported the Democratic Party mm -hmm. by 80 to 90 percent. Um, now it's a mix of Hispanics. Hispanics clearly continuing to seem to trend. Um, towards the GOP. You also just have generational replacement in these communities. So the most strongly democratic black and Hispanic voters are older voters who, uh, you know, adhere to the sort of 1960s civil rights alignment um, that is no longer necessarily happening with younger voters. And this was a trend actually before, and we were seeing this a little bit bef even before Trump. But I think the bigger the bigger idea here is that this is happening around the world. This is not only a Trump-specific phenomenon. Uh, if you look at countries around the world, um, you're seeing this convergence. And, and the, the idea, I think, we have a particular kind of, let's say, multiracial, multiethnic politics in the United States that is a little bit different. And, uh, you know, my argument is that essentially the working class realignment affects those voters too, right? Uh, you know, they are not exempt. That maybe we're exempt through 2016, they are no longer exempt from this 50 year long realignment that we've seen. So let me ask you then to assess what type of candidate, the median working class Obama Trump voter that you write about in your book, what, can, what kind of candidate might they ideally opt for in some future hypothetical post-Trump GOP nominating contest? Is it your assessment that the voter, that that voter is most likely to opt for a politician earnestly committed to and deeply familiar with the new right or national conservative policy ideas like, like a robust industrial policy, rejection of free market orthodoxy, uh, unabashed social conservatism, and, and kind of winding down American power projection abroad, someone in the mold of a uh, J.D. Vance or Blake Masters? Or would they be more likely to support someone closer to the mold of, well, Donald Trump? Uh, and, and only nominally political, hyper-masculine kind of cultural figure with celebrity status, immense wealth, and a, and a cult-like following who expresses an ideology that is less rigid, kind of vaguely libertarian and aggressively patriotic, someone like a, like a Dave Portnoy or a Joe Rogan. Um, I ask because I'm curious about how much the shifts in the Republican electorate are about which policies are proposed versus how and by whom policies are presented. I would say it's more the latter than the former. Now, I think there's a pretty large error. I mean, there's a pretty large error band around that because I think we underestimate the extent to which Trump came. Yeah, Trump nominally came from outside the system, but he has been a political operator for 40 years. Uh, he's been on the fringes of politics as a donor, as con someone very media savvy, uh, not not only media savvy in the sense of the working the celebrity media, but um, media savvy in the sense of working the political media and really stringing the political media along, uh, you know, convincing them, way but going back to 1988, that he would run for president. So I think Trump is sui generis. Right. Yes. And I think yeah, the, there are figures like that in our politics right. today, too, right? So maybe the better comparison would be not a, a J.D. Vance or a Blake Masters, but right, like a, like a Tucker Carlson versus a, a Dave Portnoy, right? I mean, we're going down kind of like silly rabbit holes here to a certain extent. But again, my question is, is like, is it about posture or is it about policy? It's about attitude. 
And yeah. I think that it's about attitude more than it is about policy, because I think you could point to ways in which, yes, Trump did reorient the Republican Party on trade. But he didn't really reorient it on taxes. If you look at his tax bill, it was a very heavily weighted tax bill to the rich and corporations. And, uh, you know, the sort of pu- true believers, the American compasses of the world, the uh, J.D. Vance's of the world, you know, would say, uh, you know, maybe that tax bill was a mistake. Uh, or they would have a hard time, let's say, arguing, squaring the support for that tax bill with the set of principles that they espouse. Um, ultimately, I don't think voters are paying very close attention to the finer nuances of tax policy at the end of the day. And um, you really have candidates. I mean, I think, uh, and I think this applies to both Republicans and Democrats. So the, the candidates that are, are able to um, really uh, capture this working class majority. Right. I mean, it's a vibes based shift. I mean, Bill Clinton. I mean, I, I really at the end of the book, you know, I, I, when I talk about the, who, who is the ideal candidate, I talk about two people. I talk about Donald Trump, but I also talk about Bill Clinton as somebody who uh, empathized with uh, working people, felt your pain, um, was able to tell stories. Right. His campaign speeches were less a litany of policy proposals, but more storytelling about the challenges that uh, average Americans faced. And I think that that is true across the board, and that's always been true. Um, yeah, you bring up uh, you bring up econ policy, um, and and kind of how Trump didn't necessarily land with that first major tax proposal, uh, where where a lot of folks expected him to. Um, do you think people uh, do you think people vote for who is primarily? Uh, you know, determine people's vote. Is it primarily determined by where candidates stand on the issues that are most important to the electorate? Or is it primarily determined by where candidates stand on the issues that voters kind of understand most intuitively, right? I'm, I'm thinking about this large plurality or even possibly a majority of voters who tell us every election cycle that their top issue is inflation in the economy or taxes and government spending. But they then are, you know, they're not deeply familiar with the full suite of both party set of recommendations on fiscal and monetary policy. Um, that, you know, are, are these folks actually going out and and checking what their candidates are saying on on different economic policy proposals, or are they, you know, ultimately making their decisions at the ballot box based on issues that are lower down on self-reported uh, priority lists in polling, but uh, that are a little more cut and dry in terms of when candidates stake out their position, like, like say abortion or, or guns? So there's an asymmetry between social and economic issues. Um, so voters polarize on social policy in a way that they don't really polarize on economic policy because they don't really understand economic policy as well. It's, it's uh, harder to understand. So um, in the book, I talk about, you have this populist quadrant of voters, voters who, espouse center-left views on economic policy issues. Uh, So the questions would be something like, you know, should taxes go up um, for people making over $400,000 a year? Um, Should we have, uh, should we protect Social Security at all costs, right? Uh, You know, voters espouse kind of broadly, uh, you know, uh, you know, I would not say leftist position on those issues, but sort of broadly left of center positions on those issues. Well, on many social issues, um, you know, their instincts are more conservative, right? Uh, yeah, they are. Um, they are, uh, you know, not necessarily like not on an issue like abortion. Abortion, I think, is a very, very clearly, a very clearly a different issue. Um, but the way we've kind of Trump redefined these cultural issues, right? Before the Republican Party, before Trump, the cultural issues were defined primarily in terms of moral and religious issues, abortion, gay marriage. Post-Trump, it's kind of a back to the future where it's it's kind of the, uh, I think, the kind of cultural issues that MI deals with, right? Uh, crime, uh, you know, the impact of migration on cities. Yeah. Uh, issues that have appeal, or I think issues that have resonance to the normie suburban voter who would not necessarily buy into a religious right agenda. Yeah, let's 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 unpack that about Trump a a little bit further. Right. So, you know, I want to ask you about his his, Trump, the man and how you sort of assess his political talents. He's he's obviously still majorly relevant. Uh, You write in the book that uh, about this big RNC, Republican National Committee autopsy report following the 2012 presidential election loss and how 
conventional wisdom in the party was that there was desperate need for moderation on immigration issues in order to expand GOP support among minorities. Um, but Trump just it, it takes a different approach. Immigration in 2015 was nowhere near the, the top of the issue prioritization list in GOP uh, primary voter polls. Um, but Trump just basically keeps hammering on the matter and, until it is. Uh, he, you know, whether, and then whether it was for the build the wall chance or insulting that Mexican judge or attacking Mexico for importing drugs, crime, rapists, et cetera, across the border, right and left wing media attacked Trump for the way he spoke about the subject. Um, but he just keeps doubling and tripling down on his comments with, without apology. And soon enough, aside from the economy, immigration is you know the top reported priority among Republican voters in polls, and it has basically remained there ever since. Uh, so you know much of this could also be said for how Trump reshaped the debate around our approach to China. Um, so what is it about the guy? I mean, does he have a does he just have a horse sense for the right issues to tackle and positions to take, or is it more so that voters appreciate his fierce unwillingness to back down and, you know, willingness to spit in the eye of his detractors. You know, are they enticed by the shifts in the direction of his policy or are they mystified by the brazenness of the man himself? Uh, well, there's a lot to unpack there, but I would sh push back a little bit on this idea that immigration was not a top issue. And, uh, you know, I don't I'm, I, I don't have access to the, what, exactly what the polling showed in, in early 2015. But uh, if you look at the core Republican base of voter, um, starting in the late George W. Bush era, uh, there was a simmering discontent on the issue of immigration, particularly uh, in response to George W. Bush as the leader of the party, um, pushing for a comprehensive immigration reform solution. Remember that he pushes for it. It was the Kennedy, McCain Kennedy bill. It gets shot down, uh, you know, and and, uh, you know, because the base is livid over uh, over this and they try again and again and again. And, um, you know, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, the autopsy was correct, right, in its diagnosis of the problem in terms of, yeah, it's going to be a problem in a country that's going to be majority minority by 2050 if you can't compete very effectively with non-white voters right that is that is that is the absolutely correct diagnosis but they seem to have been wrong about the cure right and the idea of moderating uh, that the idea that if you moderated on immigration or comprehensive immigration reform or did uh, some form of uh, regular you know uh, some sort of amnesty that you would win hispanic voters i mean that seems to have been wrong um, now, I think the issue has turned in the post uh, in the Biden era. Right. Uh, you know, in the politics have shifted dramatically. But I think within the Republican primary electorate um, leading up to Donald Trump, there was this, um, you know, kind of volcano. Right. Uh, ready to burst on immigration. And they really felt like they were not getting uh, the Republican base was not getting from their leadership. Um, uh, their views weren't being represented. Um, you had basically party leadership in D.C. continuing to push back on this idea of, uh, you know, doing uh, some sort of comprehensive solution. And then uh, it seems to Mitt Romney eventually kind of gives into this and runs on this idea of, quote, self-deportation. Ironically, it's Donald Trump who right after the 2016 election attacks Mitt Romney for that and saying, you know, he had this maniacal idea of self-deportation that, that pushed away all the Hispanics, pushed away all the Asian voters uh, and everyone who was inspired to come into this country. That's a quote from Donald Trump. So later he opportunistically, this horse sense you talked about, he opportunistically latches on to the idea uh, of uh, building the wall. Um, it was not, I think, maybe his initial instinct, but he latched on to that issue because there was a very clear dema unmet demand. And if you looked at the early stages, right, of the 2016 race and what kind of choices voters were being given, um, you know, they were not, there was nowhere in that field of 16 uh, an immigration hardliner. Um, you had at the time Jeb Bush being the front runner, echoing very much of the politics of the autopsy and his brother on the issue. Um, so I think there was a very wide open lane, you know, for a candidate with some political skill 
to drive this issue. Now, there have been other candidates before who tried to drive it, the Pat Buchanan's of the world or Town Tank Kratos, you know, but they just did not, you know, they were not a show, they were not showmen. They were not um, somebody um, who had this broad appeal that was a, more than just a political, uh, you know, a, a, the most strident hard right um, conservatism. Okay, so as we go down this route, I'm gonna ask you to take off your author cap and put on your kind of political consultant pollster cap because that is your day job. Um, and, and if a candidate, and, and I'll ask you this, again, a kind of hypothetical, if a candidate or potential client comes to you uh, in your capacity as this professional messaging expert and says, I am not on board with many of these, you know, what they would call protectionist or isolationist or restrictionist policy ideas that are commonly associated with this new GOP, I want to run for office as an old school Reagan Republican. I want to, and I want to hit back. You talked about this earlier. I want to hit back at any opponents who attack me for being too hawkish on foreign policy or too free market oriented on economic policy by accusing them of being too left wing for office. What would you say to that person? Is that someone you would be open to taking on as a client? And do they have a chance of winning a nominating contest for federal or statewide office? And Today's GOP. I would love. Let me just say, I would love to work for that kind of person. However, <laughs> I'd love to from a, a personal alignment. You probably see me have the Reagan books on my shelf behind me. Yeah. So that's not what they pay you for, though. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> I would say, like Mike Pence tried that. And he's mm. no longer in the race now. I think there's a difference between maybe a candidate holding those positions and going into office. And, you know, if they get elected and uh, those are the issues that in the Senate that they work on, I think you have a great many, frankly, people, particularly in the United States Senate, who are still operating under that under that kind of philosophy. Right. But they just campaigned on different issues. They were probably campaigning on immigration uh, in at least in to win a Republican primary. Um, they probably you know, either sought the Donald Trump endorsement or tried to cozy up in some way to his voters uh, in order so that, you know, when they get into office, right, they can advance uh, a set of beliefs that are more than just what they campaigned on. But I don't think are necessarily oppo that opposed in the minds of many voters. I would push back on this idea that, let's say, the Republican Party has or the Republican base has completely kind of rejected that old uh, old school Reagan philosophy. Um, I just don't think they prioritize many of those issues. Um, so I think if you uh, if you ask Republican voters, you know they are broadly speaking for reducing taxes. They are broadly speaking for military strength. They don't want U.S. troops fighting in Ukraine. Uh, they don't want U.S. troops fighting in the Middle East. Uh, nobody really wants that, right? I mean, I mean that is not a desirable policy outcome. I think in the, in the sense. Um, yeah, there is some skepticism, right, towards some more intervention. But when you ask, uh, you know, specifically, there is, a, you know, a, yeah, I would say even a, a pretty even 50 split, 50 split, depending on how you ask the question on even some an issue like aid to Ukraine. So I don't think you could actually point to uh, a situation or, or, or I don't think you could actually point to an issue where there's been a complete 180 in the Republican base on uh, on on these issues, where I think there's been like a 180, right, has been um, you had uh, maybe leaders like Ronald Reagan, leaders like George H.W. Bush, who were able to advance, a, let's say, an issue like free trade. But it was not an issue that Republican voters deeply cared about. It was not an issue that re Republican voters, uh, you know, were voting elected. That that's what they elected. Ronald Reagan to do. And they elected Ronald Reagan to, you know, fundamentally speaking, reverse the decline in the country and speaking. And that was not just an economic decline. That was a perceived cultural decline in the country. And I think that's broadly consistent with, I think, the, the mood that Donald Trump tried to capture in 2016, down to copying Reagan's Make America Great Again slogan. I think I have the button that says Reagan make America great again. So I, I think we have overplayed. Like, look, I said, if you're a Mike Pence style candidate, that you are going to die on the hill of 
specific advancing specific policy proposals. Uh, I no, I don't think that's the best path. And now that, that's the advice I would give to maybe some, uh, somebody who came at it from the other direction. Say, I want to, uh, you know, specifically every single one of my stump speeches, uh, I want to advance a sort of national conservative, national populist uh, agenda, talking about uh, industrial policy, talking about financialization. Um, I think voters think that's weird. Right. I, I think he's somebody who is advancing I mean, somebody who's just a policy wonk and, you know, isn't really trying to relate to them as individuals. So I think I think either can get elected. Right. Either who people who espouse those types of belief can get elected. I just don't think that, uh, you know, somebody who, you know, is really is seen as so dogmatically ideological. Right. Has an advantage that you need. You know, somebody with who is, you know, primarily about, you know, connecting to uh, people, right, uh, to, uh, you know, a, who uh, really empathizes with people's daily concerns and challenges and is able to nimbly adapt to um, changing politics. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, OK, so Trump beats Hillary in 2016. And that's kind of the premier, uh, this, this coalition, this, you know, the, the new GOP, the you know, party of the people, uh, makes, its, makes its debut on the national stage when that happens. But the GOP, this new GOP coalition that you write about in your book has, been, has pretty consistently failed to deliver electoral wins since then. Um, the politicians like, that we you know, talked about earlier in the podcast, lo- most emblematic of the ideological shift toward New right populism, the you know the the, the Blake Masterses or the J.D. Vances, either lost or way underperformed a moderate traditional Republican on the same ballot. I'm referring to Mike DeWine here, who ran for uh, Ohio governor when ran, Vance ran for Senate. Um, so there have been some there have been some electoral bright spots for the GOP in the last few years, right? There's Glenn Youngkin, Ron DeSantis, and even uh, Lee Zeldin here in New York, who didn't win his gubernatorial race, but came remarkably close and, and, and brought some people into the House uh, because of his overperformance. Um, they all way overperformed Trump in their states. Why, why do you think that is? I mean, does that have something to do with, like you talked about earlier, right, uh, how hard these guys leaned into a tough-on-crime approach and a, and a newer set of cultural issues relating to gender and, and race? Um, and I, I guess I'm just wondering, right, like, the political bargain question. If you lose white, college-educated, middle and upper class voters in the suburbs, but you gain among minority working class voters, are, are, are you getting a good deal politically? So I think you have to separate the question of the coalition and the voters and the candidates. And I think those are enti- actually two entirely, different can- that's, uh, two entirely different questions. I think from a coalition standpoint, I lean hard into the idea that you know, a coalition based on more working class voters, but specifically more non-white voters would be superior and is superior to a coalition, let's say is the 2012 Romney coalition, um, which really actually does pretty well among white college educated voters. Um, So the reason I say that is if you look at who had the electoral, the advantage in the electoral college in 2016, Donald Trump was able to win the electoral college with over 300 electoral votes by still losing and still losing the popular vote by two points. Prior to that, it was Republicans who were disadvantaged in the Electoral College, or just purely from a naked self-interest perspective. Um, the coal, a coalition rooted more in the working class is more electorally efficient, and it was more, even more, by the way, even more electorally efficient in 2020. Now, you're right, Trump doesn't win. Uh, the mini Trumps running in 2022 don't win, the Blake Masters, the Dr. Oz's, right? They don't win, uh, Herschel Walker, right? I mean, uh, those, uh, we know we know uh, all of those examples, but what's interesting about, let's say the normal politicians in the Trump era, the normal Republicans in the Trump era, I, I think of somebody like Brian Kemp. But Brian Kemp is able to essentially recreate the entire Trump coalition in Georgia. There is no part of Georgia where Brian Kemp runs behind Donald Trump. Likewise, in Virginia, there is no part of Virginia where, uh, you know, John Youngkin 
doesn't runs either runs behind Donald Trump or only has a slight overperformance over Donald Trump. He had uh, he uh, you know ran much stronger in the rural southwestern corner of the state, the uber Trumpy that was voting Democratic as recently as you know back in the Mark Warner days. Um, so uh, you know I think that um, it, it, when we talk about these normal strong manager competent Republicans like Youngkin and Kemp. Um, you know, they're able to win by basically assembling, taking the entire Trump coalition that is now a Republican coalition that shows up for Republican candidates, whether or not Donald Trump is on the ballot. And then they add some suburban voters. They add suburban voters pri primarily to that. That's that seems to be the formula. When I mean, you look at Elise Zeldin, right, um, you know, I don't know how much of a, a distinction I would make between him and, uh, you know, a, a Trumpian populist style of politics. I think, you know, his is in many ways the playbook for how you make a comeback in blue states. And it's it's not by, you know, running up margins necessarily in the suburbs. Um, it is by doubling your share of the vote in New York City, winning Asian voters, winning Hispanic voters. Um, and let's not forget, those are still growing segments of the electorate. So the white college educated voter um, clearly can swing a lot. Like we see them swing a lot. Um, you know, you know, Kemp runs way ahead of uh, Herschel Walker in Georgia among these voters, much more so than in any other group. Uh, so I don't want to dispute that, but they're not growing as a share of the electorate. Uh, they won't be in, in 20 in 10, 20 years, an even bigger share of the electorate than they are now. You have Fewer whites, but more people may be earning degrees. But you will definitely have more Asian voters. You would definitely will have more Hispanic voters. And I think, you know, I argue that that was the urgent challenge coming out of the 2012 race is how do you win more of those voters? Um, and it seems like we've done so, Republicans have done so, uh, more with a populist appeal rather than the moderation that uh, was being called for by the Republican autopsy and others at the time. Okay, point taken. I think that's all right. Um, you got to divide out the coalition piece from the candidate piece. So let me ask you another question on, on, on the coalition element of this, right? Um, increasingly, it seems like wokeness has passed its cultural peak. There are left of center voices, institutions, donors, and politicians who are actively shunning the label and questioning the wisdom of pouring vast amounts of resources into these massive DEI bureaucracies that are aggressive in policing nasty speech geared toward certain minority groups, but struggle to find the words of condemnation when Jews are being targeted on campus or Asians are being discriminated against in, in college admissions. So would, would anti-wokeness, colorblindness, or meritocracy be a better organizing principle for the GOP than economic populism? Would that afford a, a way to maintain a broader coalition of voters who are both blue collar and white collar? Um, it seems like maybe DeSantis or Ramaswamy in their presidential campaigns, um, you know, kind of both of them may have initially started to try to do something like this, but obviously it doesn't really take off in either case, uh, at least so far. What, what, what do you make of that? You know, the, the organizing principle factor, you know, does it have to be uh, an economic uh, language, or can it be one about uh, fairness or merit or colorblindness? It just yeah, I mean, I think to some extent, when you look at the performance of these candidates, I think it's a maybe an example of a good idea taken too far. Where I, I do think there is uh, there has been why there has been you know a shift right on social issues, with maybe the exception of abortion, is the sense that you know the the left was triumphant in its social issue uh, crusades, right? I mean, if you look at what was happening right before 2015, look at what happened uh, right around the time Donald Trump was announcing, right? You had the Obergefell decision. You had the, um, you know, you had the awakening. You had the Confederate flag being taken down by Nikki Haley over the South Carolina Capitol grounds. Um, all of these, uh, you know, and it, it really kind of happening in a two, three week span in June 2015 seemed to herald, you know, a new moment of progressive cultural triumph. As a result of that, the battleground shifts. Uh, and now it's no longer about, okay, we have, uh, you know, we have victory, you know, we've proclaimed victory 
in the culture war and uh, we get to go home now, uh, we're going to up the ante. We're going to up the stakes. It's going to be less about, it's not going to be a quality of opportunity. It's going to be, it's not going to be equality. It's going to be equity. It's going to be a quality of outcomes, right? Rather than a quality of opportunity. Um, so the left has gotten more and more extreme, right? It, it, it emboldened by some of these victories, which were, you know, in many ways, the right, vi you know, they, they, you know, they, uh, they rightly won some of these victories, but, um, it, you know, some people on the left took it too far. And I think there was a pendulum shift, a shift, right, uh, on some of these issues. When you talk about, um, you know, what happened with the DEI bureaucracy, what happened in the schools during the pandemic, um, there was a sense of left wing cultural overreach, uh, where, uh, you know, people's like normal, you know, suburban values, right, people who are pretty moderate on these social issues felt, uh, you know, we're seeing things in the schools that were, uh, you know, way, way off to the left. And I think that um, voters just generally, and particularly on these social questions, don't like either side when they overreach, whether it's uh, Republicans overreaching on abortion, or whether it's Democrats overreaching on uh, pushing the teaching of sexuality in ele elementary schools. Um, so I think that that was a good idea. But I think some people kind of took it a little bit too far in the sense of the median voter is not using the term cultural Marxism. They're not listening to the all in podcast. Right. I mean, you know, people it's, it goes back to the, you know, the hyper national populist national conservative uh, politicians. The median voter doesn't really care about those positioning. And I think that if that's the, the language that you see presidential candidates using, that that they'll be tuned out. You know, it's can I? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it it, it you're making a really interesting point, right? Because the median voter also doesn't know anything about, uh, you know, the the INA or premium processing fees or all of these like intricacies uh, within immigration policy. The median voter knows very little about, you know, the intricacies as we spoke about earlier of financial or you know fiscal or monetary policy, and yet like. They, they, they're totally animated by economic and immigration as policy issues. So what are these guys missing, right? Like, why can't they deliver an anti-woke message in sort of clearer person-to-person -person terms the way politicians like Bill Clinton and Donald Trump have done such a good job of doing uh, on, on the economic I, I just think that, uh, uh, you know, I would still say that this is this, these issues are not – it was personal for people, right? I mean, people don't necessarily live in, uh, you know, when they see it in their communities, when they see it in their their own kids' schools, they react viscerally to it. But, um, you know, a lot of this is, for a lot of people, right, they're not really seeing it in their schools. Or they live in communities that are, you know, pretty racially, uh, you know, homogeneous one way or the other, right? I mean, and that's still the case, right? But it's, it's becoming less and less the case. And so you don't see these issues pop up with, um, with increasing frequency. I think the key driver of voter sense, you know, in terms of voters becoming activated on these issues is not necessarily the way that politicians on the right talk about talk, just simply talk about these issues. It is very clear examples of leftist overreach uh, that are very clearly documented. And so, uh, you know, I think that to, to an extent, you know, people are, you know, right now we saw, we've seen examples of, uh, you know, leftist overreach, uh, you know, when it comes to the war in the Middle East and the protests of the DNC, right? But, uh, you know, without these, without these examples sort of being salient and right in front of people, you know, it's very hard to, you know, sort of message, have a message that's sort of rooted in the radical left, talks about the radical left. It's a great, it's a great message for Republican primary voters. But I, I want to also just say that, like, you know, there are elements of this coalition where it is really important. And I think uh, absolutely among Asian voters, I think this message really strongly resonates. The, the message of merit really strongly resonates. Um, I actually don't think, I mean, I think for other voters, it doesn't really, I mean, when you, especially when you talk about schools, um, parents are more concerned about their kid coming home safe from school than they are concerned about the academics in their, I mean, as, as strange as, as strange as that sounds, the average parent is more, you know, exhibits more concern in polling for school safety than they do for academics at school, which is, uh, you know, which is quite a remarkable uh, which is quite a remarkable finding. But I think for Asian voters in particular who have used the education system as an engine of economic upward mobility, um, to see that under attack 
uh, in places like San Francisco and places like Fairfax County, an attack on merit-based admissions in the Harvard case, right? I mean, I think that could absolutely be a factor in, the, in their realignment, uh, including my Asian American college educated voters, which are kind of not necessarily the are not necessarily the uh, you know, when I talk about a multiracial populist coalition, primarily non college voters, that's not who you immediately think about. But I think that that is, uh, in particular, something that could be very powerful moving forward. So as we move toward the end here, I feel like it would be silly not to at least ask you one question about what's going on on the left side of the spectrum uh, with the Democratic Party. Obviously, the book is about the right and the remakings of the GOP coalition, but you do touch on uh, some phenomenons going on on the left at, at certain points in the book. Uh, you, you write about this, this left-wing data scientist by the name of David Shore um, and his advocacy for what he terms popularism. Um, can you speak a little bit about why you included him in the book, what you make of the state of today's Democratic Party, uh, please define, of course, what this what his what this popularism concept is, and I guess whether you believe it is a smart approach to campaign politics for the left, as well as even so potentially David Shore was somebody who emerged in 2020 um, as uh, you know somebody who was a Democratic data scientist who was fired from his job at one of the leading Democratic data firms because he tweeted something deemed insufficiently woke. And what he tweeted was uh, during the George Floyd summer that um, a research on the 1968 election where race riots uh, were actually associated with a decline in Democratic vote share, this you know elected Richard Nixon. And so the parallel I think he was trying to draw was that if you have, if you see these images of violence on your TV, that that really risks reelecting Donald Trump versus if you had a pre more peaceful protest um, that could help Joe Biden. Biden, right. I mean, that was the point he was trying to make. But, um, you know, that he, he was immediately attacked and assaulted by the left online and uh, really hectored and badgered out of his out of his job. But he reemerges as this prophet of, uh, you know, prophet of doom in, the, in a time when, you know, Joe Biden was well ahead in the national polls. Um, you know, he talks about this issue of education polarization as a long term threat to the Democratic Party, uh, not just in presidential elections. I talked about the Electoral College advantage, um, but also in the Senate, um, where, you know, you don't have a pure popular. This is not a purely popular majority. It's not a popular majoritarian institution. It is a state by state representation. And if you have rural, smaller rural states having the same amount of votes as California in the Senate, um, you know, the uh, the coalition with more support with rural voters is going to have an advantage in the in the Senate. Um, so, you know, I think his, you know, he comes uh, genuinely seems to come at this from somebody who comes very strongly from the left, including I think he at one point he had a or maybe still has a rose emoji, right, which is the Democratic Socialist emoji in his bio. But he talks about, um, you know, the idea of this back to the future approach that candidates should uh, you know, take popular positions, do popular things, um, you know, really emphasize the parts of their party's message that have the most support in polling. And you would think, why, I mean, why would you even need, isn't that just common sense? I mean, as a political consultant, that's like, I mean, as a pollster, I'm, I'm going to tell you the exact same thing. <laughs> but the idea that this, that the fact that this idea takes off, right, in the left and in and, and, and sort of discourse shows you how far uh, you know, the Democratic coalition seemed to have strayed from that, um, where you do have discourse, not just on defunding the police, but on racializing every issue. When the polls are very, when, re, when survey, you know, survey after survey is very clear that when you racialize issues as opposed to talk about broad benefits across the population, um, you have less support for those policy agenda items. So I think he was trying to recenter things in a more, you know, basically return us to that common sense baseline that I think everyone in the political community had, but um, was really seriously thrown off base by uh, the identity, particularly by the identity politics of the left, in addition to warning about the urban rural education polarization that really hampered Democrats or creates a kind of a structural uh, bias for Democrats against Democrats in uh, in elections moving forward. 
So it seems like this figure, David Shore, uh, has you know since since his lowest moment and and his firing has been kind of indicated in in left wing circles and you know Democratic campaign committees uh, seem to be like buying into his line of argumentation. Uh, why isn't something similar uh, taking place on the right? Uh, a kind of simple return to the baseline message of just like stop talking about you know, stolen elections because it's very unpopular uh, and will win more often. Why, why doesn't it work for for those of us who are right of center? Well, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it doesn't work. I mean, we haven't had, really had a campaign yet. Um, I think that if we do have a campaign that uh, in which the stolen election narrative uh, becomes more and more central to the campaign, then I think uh, Trump will lose ground or Trump or, you know, I mean, if it's Trump, that's the only person who's going to be talking about that issue. Right. Um, so I, I think these fundamentals apply. We saw it in 2022, right, when you had candidates who specifically uh, embraced the sort of MAGA, elect, but specifically the issue of election denial was unique. Right. It's not like these were candidates who were defined by their populist economic policy. They were defined as, as being somebody who uh, you know, really bought into these election denial narratives, uh, seemed a little bit chaotic, seemed a little bit crazy. And that's just something voters across the board don't like. And so it really is what defines this populist agenda, right? And if that it is defined by these chaos agents that um, really have no ideological commitments or have no principles, uh, only uh, engagement, right, only driving engagement on social media, then um, you're going to get a very different outcome than, say, somebody who sort of advocates broad policies um, for the working class. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's the issue set, the context of the election really, really matters here because I think that, um, it, you know, it is very issue specific. So um, I think in 2022, more so than the abortion issue, I think in these specific individual districts, you know, where you had candidates who were really closely associated with the MAGA wing and with the election denial did uh, across the board five points worse than candidates who just ran on a more generic Republican message. So I think it does work. It does actually happen. OK, Patrick, last question. Uh, it's a softball. You're a pollster. What's going to happen in the 2024 election? We don't predict anything, right? I mean, we just measure, you know, kind of where <laughs> things are now, right? Um, <laughs> well, where are we at? Where I mean, are we at the, now the, the then? You, you, right. Fine, but, give well, me a look, snapshot. I think, that, I think just the, the basic reading of the polls right now would indicate that in a Trump-Biden rematch, Trump is a slight favorite. If the election were held today, Trump is a slight favorite. But that doesn't account for, you know, what if there's a conviction? There's, you know, some risk of that, right? At least some. And pretty significant, actually. And there are also significant risks on, on the Biden side. Um, but I think that right now, um, you know, what you're seeing, particularly in this New York Times Siena polls, but it's echoed in a lot of other polls right now, is serious non-white working class erosion for Joe Biden. Um, you have uh, the Electoral College advantage potentially uh, taking shape again. So, you know, if that manifests in the same way, and I think what thing that people discount, right, if this these same coalitions kind of manifest in 2024 as in 2020, uh, and there's probably good reason to assume they will if you have the two the exact same the exact same candidates on the ballot. Uh, that Joe Biden needs to win the popular vote by at least a couple points to actually be considered the favorite in the electoral college. So we have a campaign. You know, it'll, it'll be a, it'll be a long campaign, right? And he'll have have the chance to make the case, and he'll have a chance to try to frame it as a choice between Trump and 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 Biden. I suspect Trump will. Uh, certainly comply with many of Biden's wishes in terms of making it all about him as opposed to being about as opposed to being about Joe Biden. But uh, but uh, yeah, but I, I do think at the moment, um, I don't think you should underrate, you know, even with the legal cloud over him. I don't think you should underrate Trump's chances. Sounds like time will tell. Yeah, not a firm answer, but but I'll accept it. Patrick's book is called Party of the People inside the multiracial populist coalition remaking the GOP. It was it was a great read. And thank you, Patrick, so much for for joining to me today on my inaugural uh, appearance hosting the Manhattan Insights podcast. Thank you so, much. so you made it you made it uh, you made it easy. Right. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. Listeners, if you like what you heard, please feel free to write a review wherever you listen and be sure to tune into future episodes of Manhattan Insights.